Synology's firewall is one of the most powerful and misunderstood features inside of DSM. Some people feel it's necessary to configure the firewall and others feel like it's a waste of time. So in this video, we're gonna look at what a firewall is, how to set up Synology's firewall in DSM, and ultimately if you should or should not configure this. Now in its absolute simplest form, a firewall allows or blocks traffic. Allowing or blocking traffic can occur at multiple levels with consumer grade routers acting as a firewall and allowing or blocking traffic from the external world. Certain operating systems have software firewalls built in that allow or block traffic based on the rules configured on that device. In the context of Synology DSM, a firewall can be configured to allow or block traffic into the NAS, and it can be done in various ways with various parameters. The entire goal of the firewall is to limit traffic down as much as you can. In some cases, that may mean entirely blocking traffic, but generally, you want to allow traffic from the devices that should connect to the NAS and block traffic from everything else. The easiest way to think of it is like a funnel. In the context of a firewall, you're allowing or blocking traffic on a specific port. Without a firewall rule configured, everyone that can access the NAS can access the port. However, you can narrow it down further to a specific country or set of countries even further to an IP range or subnet, and finally, the most restricted being individual IP addresses. Since the firewall is in effect for anyone that can access the NAS, the rules apply for internal and external traffic, assuming external traffic is permitted on the firewall. So let's look at how to configure Synology's firewall, and then we'll take a look at who should and shouldn't configure this. Okay, so we are inside of Synology DSM, and if you open up the control panel, select security and then firewall, the firewall is disabled by default. So you can click enable and apply it. And just so you know, if you enable the firewall without configuring any rules, there is absolutely nothing that's gonna happen. Now there are different firewall profiles that you can configure, but we're just gonna use the default rule to actually explain how this works. So if you select edit rules here, what you will have is your entire interface for Synology's firewall. So what I quickly wanna talk through is this all interfaces tab. Now in this all interfaces tab, basically what you'll have is all the interfaces for your NAS. Depending on the NAS device that you're using, this will look different. But what I wanna point out is if no rules in all interfaces are matched, rules in each interface will be matched. So the way that the actual firewall works is that it comes in and it checks all the rules that you have in the all interfaces tab. After that, it will then move to the individual interfaces. Now on these individual interfaces, this is extremely important. So by default, if no rules are matched, traffic will be allowed. So you could look at this as nothing's in the all interfaces tab at this point, and then when it gets to the interface, traffic is allowed. That's why it's not actually doing anything right now. So you have two options on how you can actually manage this. The first option is to actually use these individual interfaces. The downside is that you'll have to configure rules for every single interface, and depending on exactly how you configure it, different types of traffic will flow based on the actual interface. So I know it sounds confusing, but you kind of have to think of it as in extremely rare circumstances, you might have different traffic that you want permitted on different actual interfaces, and in that scenario, it does make sense to use this. However, in most cases, you're probably gonna to wanna to use just the all interfaces, which we'll take a look at in a second. But if you wanted to set it up this way, what you're actually gonna do is you are going to deny access on all of your individual interfaces. And the reason is so that once traffic hits here, if no rules actually match, the traffic will get denied by default. So then at that point, you would go into your all interfaces tab, you would create the allow rules that would apply to all of the interfaces, and then you can go in and create your actual individual interface rules on each individual interface. That, in my opinion, is the more complicated way of doing it, and I don't think this is what most people will do. I just wanna point out that that is what you can do. What I really wanna show is this all interfaces section here. So this is, in my opinion, the easiest way to manage it. So what we're gonna do, the very first thing that you have to do is you have to allow access into DSM. So before you do anything, this is the very first rule you're gonna create. You're gonna create 
an allow rule. So the action is allow. And then you're going to select from a list of built-in applications. And then what you're going to do is you are going to allow DSM. So I like to do it this way because if you ever change the DSM port, the rule won't have to be modified. So if you click OK and OK here, we have an allow rule for DSM. Now, if you save this, it will do something because we went into the individual interfaces and we denied access. But remember, by default, nothing is actually denied. So I'm just going to quickly go back and I'm going to allow access on all of these so that we're back to a default setup here. Okay, so now everything is allowed. And if I click OK here, what it's doing is it's saving the allow rule, but nothing's actually getting blocked because we are allowing all traffic. There's not a block rule. So the reason it's important to configure DSM first is because if you don't, you are indirectly gonna lock yourself out. Not forever, you can do a network reset, which I'll leave a link to in the description, but this is the most important rule that exists on your NAS. Now the next rule that we're gonna configure is a deny all rule. So you're gonna select all, all, deny, and then you're gonna select okay. So. Inside of Synology's firewall, firewall rules are executed from top to bottom. So the rule comes in, it checks to see if traffic is permitted, and then it moves on to the next rule. So at this point, if traffic is not coming from DSM or any of these other default services that use the DSM port, it will be blocked. So to give you an example, I have file station configured here on port 7001. So if I come in and try and access that service, it's not gonna work because traffic is not actually allowed. But if we go back into Synology's firewall now and we create a rule, and I'm just gonna create a custom rule at this point because we know it's port 7001, we'll get to this in a second here. But we create a custom rule and we move it above the deny all rule, because remember rules come from top to bottom, and we select okay. If we come back to this and we access this service, traffic is allowed. So that's an extremely basic example of how Synology's firewall works. Now, like I said earlier, your entire goal is to limit traffic as much as you can. Limiting traffic is gonna depend on the service that you're actually using. But if we go in and we edit this rule here, what we did is we set up a custom port. So TCP and UDP is what you're gonna be traditionally using, but there are other options here. And what we did is we typed in a custom port. So technically, you can type in multiple ports if you'd like and separate them by a comma. And this rule would apply to each and every one of them, but we're gonna leave it at 7001 for now. The other option is port range. You can do 7001 to 7009, and then every single port in between would be open. But again, we're gonna leave this to 7001. So the big thing here that I wanna show is this source IP here. This is how you limit traffic down. So the first thing that we're gonna take a look at, back to our funnel example, is the location. So if you come here, you can actually select a country. I'll select my country here. And what this would actually allow us to do is confirm that only access from this specific country would be able to access the NAS. Now for country or location rules, this does not apply to internal subnets and IP addresses. So if you allow the United States of America, you are only allowing IP addresses that are external IP addresses originating from the United States of America. So this rule is generally used with a local rule as well, and we'll take a look at the local rule in a second here. But let's assume you were using a reverse proxy and you wanted to allow traffic only from your country, this is what the rule would look like. Now in the specific IP, this is the big one here. Again, your goal is to limit traffic down as much as you can. The absolute most restricted option here would be to come in and type in one individual IP address. That could be a local IP address, but more likely an external IP address. And that external IP address would most likely be used in conjunction with port forwarding. If you were port forwarding, let's say hyper backup so that you could back up this NAS to another NAS and you only wanted to allow that one external IP address to access hyper backup vault on that port you would come in here and type in that one external IP address. Generally, this is used for that, but you can also allow a subnet. So my subnet here is 192.168.254 on this test network. So if I use this subnet right here, 192.168.254.0, and then the subnet mask 255.255.255.0, what this is doing is the entire 192.168.254 subnet would be allowed to actually access the NAS on this specific port. So if your only goal is to whitelist your entire 
subnet. You can do that by creating individual rules or by creating an all rule, which we'll take a look at in a second here. But just so you're aware, the other option here is actual IP ranges. So in this example, 192.168.254.100 to 105 would be allowed. So the local IP address for the device I'm currently on is .124. So if I come in and allow this, you're gonna see that we can't access this anymore. And the reason is because we block traffic. But if we go back here and we change that rule back to being the entire subnet, and then we were to go in and actually save this, because we're allowing the entire subnet, this will load right up. So again, your goal is to limit traffic down as much as you can with the understanding that you might have to create multiple firewall rules to actually allow a service. So for example, let's assume 7001 was exposed externally and we only wanted it to be accessible by our country and our local subnet. What we would do is we would keep this rule here but then we'd actually go in and create a second rule for our specific country. And then what we would do is drag it up. And then we're saying that this port, 7001, is accessible by this entire local subnet and the entire United States of America. So that is how you can use one or multiple rules to limit traffic. Now, the final thing I wanna show is let's assume that you wanted to allow only traffic to all of your services from your local subnet you can change this port 7001 to all. And then what you're doing is you're saying that access to all ports in this specific subnet here is allowed. So that's how you can limit traffic down to your entire subnet. Now, traditionally, you're gonna create allow rules for your individual services. So if you're going in and you're using Synology Drive, for example, or Hyper Backup Vault, you're gonna come in here and I would recommend, even though you can select multiple here, I'd recommend creating an individual rule for each. It's just a better way of managing it, in my opinion. But what you're then gonna do is you're gonna fill up your firewall with all the services that you're actually using. You're gonna come in here, and again, you're gonna know exactly what is allowed and what is not allowed. So again, without this denial rule, it's not actually gonna do anything. But the final thing I wanna show is if you delete this deny all rule and you come in into all of these individual interfaces and you deny access like I did earlier, traffic will be denied because it's going to go from the all interfaces tab directly to those individual interfaces and then because nothing exists, it will get blocked. Just remember that if you use a subnet and you're using a VPN, you have to allow access on the VPN subnet as well. So you really have to think through this. This is gonna start out with the DSM port. You have to make sure you allow access on the DSM port. And then you're gonna slowly build these rules. And I think it's realistic to say, there's a chance that some of your services temporarily are going to break until this is configured properly. Now that we looked at the configuration process, it's important to look at this in the context of your own environment. The first thing you need to consider is where you should spend your time limiting traffic. For example, if you're worried that friends or family connect to your Wi-Fi and will technically be able to connect to your NAS if they tried, your time is probably better spent segregating your network and creating a guest network for those users. But if you're using Synology's reverse proxy server, your NAS is technically exposed to the world. And if you know for a fact that all incoming traffic should at most be originating from your country, using Synology's firewall to limit traffic down on port 443 to your country and local subnet is mandatory and will increase the security of your device by a lot. The most difficult scenario is for people who have segregated networks and know the device is not accessible externally. In that case, it's a limited number of devices and you're generally aware of what is and isn't connecting to the NAS. In this scenario, your decision to use or not use this feature comes down to if you wanna hold yourself accountable and know exactly what is and isn't allowed to connect to the NAS. For example, if you configure Synology Drive and you've never used it before, it won't work without a firewall rule. So you have to consciously go into the firewall and allow it. If you don't, it won't work. There's a benefit in knowing what can and can't connect, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's required, more optional, but for context, I use it so that I know exactly what is and isn't allowed on the NAS, but that doesn't mean that you have to. Hope this video helped out. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.